Hello there, welcome to Field Study, an exploration of food and the landscape. So here we are in the middle of August and uh, today is the first day that it's rained after a month long drought. So it's kind of a relief and you can really feel it in the landscape. Um, so I thought what better excuse than to get out for a lovely walk in the hills and to introduce you guys to four edible plants that are good to eat right now. Stay tuned. So you can tell just how dry it's been recently. Uh, this pathway here is usually a stream. So there's usually water flowing all the way down the pathway and you've got to sort of uh, wade <laughs> and squelch through mud. But as you can see, the river rocks are all dry. It's uh, dry as a bone. So the plants give a, a bit of a key that there usually is water down here on this pathway. Uh, this is a type of mint. I think it might be water mint. It's all grown in here as well, look. So there are a couple of uh, identifying characteristics of uh, mints in general. So I'll just pick that. So you see it's got these opposite pairs of leaves going up the stem. Side by side, side by side, side by side. Uh, with this sort of cluster or whirl of flowers. That's also indicative of a mint species. And then this is uh, what's interesting, is the square stem. So the stem itself is in a square. Uh, you can feel this best if you roll it between your fingers, you'll be able to feel the ridges. So uh, mints have square stems. Other plants do also have square stems, but that is one of the key identifying features of a mint. Another identifying feature of uh, mint species is the smell. So they are usually hairy and furry and quite glaucous, and they usually have a lovely smell. So think mint, apple mint, that sort of thing. That's what you're looking out for. So making an exact ID on a mint can be pretty tricky uh, because they hybridize so readily. That's why in uh, sort of cultivated mints and things, you can get things like chocolate mint, pineapple mint, where they've uh, crossbred lots of different uh, mutant mints and have got different flavors and aromas out of them. Um, this one's beautiful. It's, um, it's sort of sweet, it's spearminty, and it's gonna make an absolutely lovely mint tea. <laughs> So as of all these things that I'm picking today, if you want 100% on your identification, don't pick it and certainly don't eat it. I'll put some resources in the description below of books that you can buy and places that you can learn more about plant identification. All right, let's carry on the walk and see what else we can find. So this plant here is one that might be familiar to you. It's Geum urbanum or uh, wood avens is one of the common names. It has another common name, but I'll uh, let you in on that a little bit later on. So this is an interesting plant. You'll probably recognize the seed heads because what happens is at this time of year, the, uh, the seed heads dry out and you'll find that they get stuck readily to animal fur. So you'll often be picking these off of your, uh, your dog or cat when they come in. And it has these little seed heads on it which uh, sort of flake apart and they're sort of in the shape of a comma. And yeah, these will get stuck on any animal fur and that's how it spreads itself through the forest. So you'll often find this on uh, animal tracks. So key identifying things for this plant is the, uh, the leaf shape. So it will have leaves like this. So they sort of somewhat resemble a strawberry. Um, so they have serrated leaves. They go off into three leaflets such as that and then you'll also notice that very commonly they have two leaves uh, on either side of the stem where the trifolate leaflet uh, sort of joins onto it so in the summer it has a yellow flower on top um, the latin name for this is interesting so it's geum urbanum so this was once a very common plant on the roadsides of cities and towns and urban areas uh, before pollution and things so much so that when they came to name it, they named it after the place that it was most commonly found. So that is urbanum, urban, urban environments. Uh, but now you can find it on woodland edges. You'll probably know it from being in your garden. Any pathway, you'll probably come into this, come across this plant. 
Uh, so the interesting, so the int so the common name that I hinted at earlier is clove root. So the roots of this plant taste exactly like cloves, the spice. Uh, that's because they contain the same chemical compound as cloves do. Um, and these can actually be used the same way that uh, clove oil would be used. If you make an oil by steeping the roots in olive oil, it can be used to numb toothache just like cloves are. So you can eat the leaves, you can add them to salads as they are, or in the Czech Republic they are dried and uh, used as a spice or a seasoning which is very interesting, I should be trying that. Um, but the real thing that we want is below the ground. Now I need to remind you that in the UK it is illegal to uproot any wild plant without landowner's permission. So here is one that I prepared earlier. So when you pull this out of the ground, it's not too hard, the roots don't go that deep, they're rather shallow. You will be confronted with this mass of rather wiry roots. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, usually there'll be like one thick root and lots of other strands of roots on it. This one was growing out of a wall, uh, so it's got quite thin, wiry roots. So when you crush the roots, it, um, it gives off a lovely aromatic clove smell, clove and cinnamon sort of mulled spices, and it is beautiful. It smells slightly medicinal, and it has been used as a medicinal plant uh, the world over for as long as recorded history has been around. So. It can be used uh, in a tea, hot water extraction for stomach complaints and things. So yeah, wood avens. It's a common plant, you'll find it absolutely everywhere and it is delicious. Well worth getting your hands on some. So this is good to see. So this was a, a chestnut tree, a sweet chestnut tree that was, um, that fell down in the wind and they had to slice it in half. Uh, but you can see that it is growing up from the, uh, from the original stump and quite valiantly, if you look right up at the top, it's even tried to set a chestnut there, look. Ha, <laughs> look at him, what a legend. I wasn't expecting to find this here. So this is common mugwort. This is Artemisia vulgaris, one of my favorite plants in the entire world. It's a common plant that's found in uh, scrubland and on the edge of uh, pasture and farmland and stuff like that. Um, and it is a member of the wormwood family, like the wormwood that is used to flavor absinthe. So you're looking for this leaf structure and it has a pale underside. And when you crush it in your fingers, it smells absolutely wonderful and aromatic you can't really mistake it once you know the smell you'll know this plant and you'll be addicted to it forever so it's deep cool herbaceous aromatic uh, it's said to help you dream vividly and is a soporific and send you to sleep uh, it's perfect with roasted meat dishes you put this on some some lamb ribs in a marinade oh my lord it is amazing so you're looking out for uh, this leaf structure the stem is usually red as it goes up, and when it flowers, it has flowers that look a little bit like this. So they don't have petals, they're densely clustered. So once you know the smell, you'll fall in love with this plant, I know you will. It's beautiful. I actually got a cultivated form of this, which was sold as a cola plant, and they've found one uh, and hybridized it uh, to make it smell like cola bottles or like that really cheap cola drink that you used to get at school discos. And um, it's interesting. I've got it in my garden, but the, uh, purely for the pollinators, I've never used it in cooking. I'll definitely be using this uh, in the coming months in some recipe videos. Um, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not already, then hit that subscribe button to be notified uh, when that video comes out. I hope you're enjoying coming along on this walk. It's been a bit of a nightmare to film just because of the changeability of the weather, but you can't complain really. At least we had some rain this morning. Very thankful for that. So the last thing we're gonna forage for today uh, should be well known to everyone that lives in the UK. It's the first thing that we sort of get taught that we can eat when we're, when we're young. And it's potentially the only thing that people forage for as they get a little bit older or feel confident that they can. And it is the, uh, the common blackberry. 
There's certainly a culture in the, uh, the foraging community where people will try and go after the, the rarest thing. Um, but I am a firm believer that just because something is well known and very common uh, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be cherished and experimented with. Because remember, these things are just beautiful ingredients for you to use. Uh, it's what you do with them that really matters. Yeah. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to this lovely stand of brambles that I've found here. So I don't know if it's because of the drought, but certainly this is the, um, one of the best years for blackberries anyone up and down the country has ever seen. They all seem to be ripening at the same time. They're ripening early. They're putting out lovely big fruits. Um, so it's certainly a glut that we should be making the most of. Last week I showed you my, uh, my favourite cocktail recipe using the, the unripe blackberries as well as the ripe ones. Um, so I'll put the link for that up in the top corner. It is truly delicious um, and it's a perfect drink for a lovely August barbecue. Uh, so let me know if you try it, let me know what you think. So it's got a thorny stem, it's got pale undersides to its leaves, uh, it grows in a massive matted tangle. Ecologically, bramble is quite interesting because this massive matted tangle of thorny branches uh, can take over open scrubland and act as a nursery for uh, tree saplings which might otherwise get grazed off by ruminants like deer or the dreaded sheep. So what it does is it gives them a chance to get to a height where they can sort of sustain themselves. So in here is a lovely nursery for, for young trees and that is one of the, the things that bramble is good at. So next time you see it on some waste ground just know that it is making way for a beautiful forest if it's left to its own devices. Mm. They're delicious and there's such variation you can get the, um, the soft squidgy ones which are almost boozy and taste like sweets straight from the sweet shop or you can get the tart ones which taste like a, like a sherbet, le sherbet lemon and go pop in your mouth they've got that lovely firm texture to them so yeah they really are one of my favourite fruits at this time of year So there we go. I hope you enjoyed that foraging trip into the great British countryside. If you found it helpful, hit the subscribe button, hit that thumbs up, and I'll be back next week with more foraging videos and recipes from this beautiful landscape. Take care. Zip. Oh. Zip your armpits up. Zip your side bits up. Go on, make yourself presentable.